that part. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps, huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And today we are uh, very, very, very fortunate. I'm super excited, man. This is, uh, we've got Brady Leavold with us. And Brady, I, I got connected to you a couple weeks ago with one of your guests. And for those who don't know who Brady is, unbelievable story of just basically perseverance, probably working your ass off uh, in the trenches to now what you're doing now. And for those who don't know, a player who played minor hockey like all of us did, went on to play major junior out in the WHL, um, played some professional hockey, kind of achieved a bit of a dream. I think like all of us just push hockey as far as you can, make a little money playing hockey. I know it wasn't a lot of money playing some minor pro in the AHL, which is unbelievable. But uh, during that time, kind of got stuck in, 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 in some tough ruts with, uh, you know, alcohol and drugs and, and became, you know, a bit of an addict, obviously. And man, three years in jail, you know, I, I think it's, you know, and I'll let you talk more to this, but just an inspiring story, man. And, and you've had a lot of guests on that I've had on my podcast with, you know, Josh Gratton and uh, even talking about guys like uh, Brent or uh, sorry, Eric Guest and um, uh, Aaron Snow and all these, all these guys that just have gone through so much stuff and, and man, you've been a huge support for them. So first of all, how are you doing, Brady? How's everything going now? West coast kid living in Ontario. How was that? How was that transition going from the West coast, beautiful by the ocean to Ontario? How was that? Yeah. Well, first off, thanks for having me. And, and, you know, it's, it, it was fun. I mean, yeah, playing minor pro, it was fun while it lasted, but I never really gave myself a chance, even in, in the Western hockey league. I, you know, I quit every, seemed like every year and in, in dealing with mental illness and, and addiction on a smaller scale. But uh, yeah, it was, you know, just like anybody you you grow up and, and you're chasing a dream and uh, you know, I, kind of shot myself in the foot time and time again, but was still able to make the the minor pro ranks and played some time in the American league before blowing out my knee. But um, just alluding to those guys that you mentioned, they become friends of mine and I haven't had Eric on, but I've, you know, I've kept in contact with him. I know he's gone through uh, some demons of his own and it still is. And I just, you know, I, my, my hope is that he can continue to find the strength to, to push forward. It's not easy and we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah, and grew up in, in Port Coquitlam hometown of Terry Fox and, um, you know, 25, 30 minutes outside of Vancouver and four years on and off with Swift Current. My final, final year with Kelowna played online with Jamie Ben and played with Tyler Myers and Tyson Berry, Luke Shen. I mean, the list goes on. We had a great team, lots of fun. Um, had to get out of Vancouver, man. I had to get out of the area. I was, uh, eventually my addiction led me to, you know, homelessness, uh, on the downtown East side of Vancouver known as Hastings street. And if anybody doesn't know what that is, do yourself a favor and check it out for five minutes on YouTube. It'll blow your mind. And, uh, just that a place like that even exists in Canada. A lot of people don't know about it and it's just wild. I don't want to sit here and talk about it, but I was down there for, you know, 10 months and, you know, my addiction led me to uh, places I never thought it would. And, you know, when you get that wrapped up and you're serving a drug uh, and that's all you're doing, I mean, you start to do anything to maintain that addiction. So you turn to crime and different things. And that led me to, uh, you know, a 21 month jail sentence, which I served basically all of. Um, and, you know, I, I moved out to Ontario and, you know, my addiction followed me out to Ontario and, you know, I ended up uh, being arrested again out here in Ontario uh, back in 2018, I believe it was, and early 2018 and um, or seven, late 17 and early 18, somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, did another year in jail. So, you know, 33 years old now, I've done, like you said, three years in jail, two years and then a year and then got out and Luckily, you, you talk about Ontario and how, you know, the difference between growing up in BC and Ontario. I mean, I never was the afforded the opportunity to have outdoor rinks, uh, frozen lakes and this sort of yeah. thing. So it's a big part of my story. You know, I, I hadn't skated for, for eight years and God bless the Swift Current Broncos for sending me a pair of skates when I got out of jail. Uh, didn't have any gear or anything. I barely had any clothes. And so, you know, I, I tell the story. I, I skated down my girlfriend's parents' driveway right down to the lake and like a scene out of mystery Alaska. Cause the driveway was ice. It was about this time last year and uh, put on my skates. Didn't even tie them up as I often don't on the outdoor rink, but um, skated around on the lake for a few minutes. And it was in that moment. I was like, you know what? Like I've missed this. And um, at the time, I think I was maybe three weeks clean. I just celebrated a year off all the hard stuff. So that was, that was really great. And congrats, man. But yeah. And so, you know, finding my way back to hockey and started the podcast, but you know, 
it's been a it's been an interesting venture coming out to Ontario, living in Muskoka. It's obviously beautiful up here, um, but I haven't been home uh, to BC in four years. I haven't seen any of my family members in a, in a while, and uh, there was a time when they didn't really want to see me or hear from me, and I don't blame them. But things have since changed, and I've started to develop those relationships again. And I'm just really lucky to be here, man. Oh man, it's it's amazing. It's it's uh, obviously there's a purpose, right? There's there's a bigger reason why you've gone through what you've gone through. And I think even if anyone gets a chance to listen, I mean, uh, your podcast is unbelievable, and just the 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 sheer rawness of it, I love. It's just as far as people being honest and just being open about stuff that a lot of people don't want to talk about, especially in the hockey community. No one's ever gonna walk in the rink and say, "Hey, boys." you know, I'm, I'm addicted to cocaine. Hey boys, I, I'm i I'm an alcoholic. I go home every night and drink. Like no one's going to say that. And it's unfortunate. You know, you may have a couple of boys on the team that are tight. Maybe your buddy will tell you, Hey man, I'm man, I'm in one or Hey buddy, you got to get out. You got to get, you got to lay off the bottle a bit, you know, as buddies, but it's never going to come out usually in the open. And your podcast is like sitting in the locker room with a bunch of boys and all hockey guys talking about their deepest, darkest secrets, which I love and, and I've gone through it personally on, on, on a couple of different occasions. And when you start bottling stuff out in, in, inside of you, it's it's only a matter of time before it explodes, right? The more you talk about it and the more you kind of share, I feel it's not easy to do that. So the more you can do that, I mean, the, the easier it is to deal with. And and I think, you know, one thing that is really, really relevant with your podcast and I think your story and the people that you have on it is you're not alone, right? There's a yeah. lot of dudes going and, and girls, guys and girls going through the same thing that you've gone through or I've gone through or, you know, everyone's got their story, right? And we all think we're bad person going in a bad spot. We have no self-control or, you know what I mean? And no, man, there's tons. Everybody goes through this stuff, you know, in, in different ways. And I think that's one thing I love about your podcast is just open and honest about stories and people and real stories of people going through stuff that, you know, you kind of look at and you're like, Oh man, they're, they're dealing with the same thing I'm dealing with or, you know, so I love it. And it's uh yeah, I mean, it's, it's awesome. And now I know, I know you kind of changed the name. Now you said it was uh what was it before? It was um hockey to oh, heroin, hockey right? To heroin, road to recovery. Yeah. And then, yeah. uh, and now, and now you do a lot on YouTube, which is awesome. Kind of go live on YouTube and, and, um, yeah. So where can people check that out? Yeah. So now it's, I mean, the first 67 episodes or whatever was hockey to heroin, the road to recovery. And, and, you know, it was great. And I know it was hard hitting and, and people are like, what the hell that doesn't go together. And <laughs> I've since found out that, you know what, there's a lot of guys, um, that have, past struggled with opiates such as heroin and, and different things, fentanyl. Um, and unfortunately there's a lot still struggling. I have a, a teammate right now. We just did an intervention on one of my podcasts, trying to get him into treatment. He's homeless in Kelowna, living in a shelter, played in the BC hockey league and uh, played. This guy was a good player and he had a sports hernia when he was 18 and sort of derailed his career. And uh, you know, so it, just going back to what you said and I'll get to where they can watch it, but yeah, it's, I mean, I think, because I'm so open, uh, it makes people feel comfortable. You, you, my intro, they talk about, I talk about being an intravenous drug user, being in jail. Uh, so I think, you know, not too many guys can, can relate to maybe that level. And it's not to try to one up them or anything, but I do that to sort of make them feel comfortable to go, Hey, you know what? Well, this guy is saying all this. So, you know what, maybe, maybe I can share some of my stuff without feeling, you know, too, you know, too bad about it. And, and maybe it doesn't make it too much easier, but I think, yeah, like you said, it maybe makes them feel comfortable. And um, yeah, I, I go live. I do all, everything I do now is live. And I think it makes for uh, an authentic experience. And, and we open up questions and stuff at different times, depending on uh, what the conversation is like. And uh, they can check it out on Facebook, YouTube. I also go live on Twitter. So the three three uh, places that are live and then immediately following any of the the episodes they're they're uploaded to everywhere you know apple podcast yeah. spotify google podcasts it's it's pretty much everywhere and so you know primarily i get most of my listenership still through audio download i don't know what it's like for you but um it's sort of and then facebook i think my last episode since well, between the audio and everything i think we're including all the feeds are somewhere around 1500 views and it just launched two days ago. So awesome. starting to kind of pick up steam and um, you know, I think the podcast is, is one part of it, but um, because I came out with my story and going back to, to talking about how guys, you know, feel alone. And um, I, you know, I, I've told this story a few times and uh, you can, can't see it, but oh, oh, it's nailed into the wall, but there's a plaque there 
in memory of Matthew Lazinski, who was an OHL player, uh, drafted second round. I never met him. He's the same age as me, born in 87. And uh, his best friend called me after I launched a podcast after the second episode. And, and just, I didn't know him at the time either. We've since become like best friends. And he's like, man, I just had to call you because I felt like I was listening to my, my best friend. And he passed away in 2017 to an overdose. And I was like, wow, like, that, that was kind of the first one that I realized that it was another hockey player doing fentanyl. And then you fast forward two weeks from that day. Uh, I found out that my line mate, my roommate in the American Hockey League, WHL All-Star, drafted by Tampa Bay, Mitch Fadden, uh, also passed away from a fentanyl overdose two weeks apart from Matthew Luzinski. And so in that moment, I, I decided that, you know what, we need to do something. Obviously, I played against uh, Rick Rippon in junior, and, and we know of his story with mental illness and Derek Bugard, the Oxycontin and Wade Belak. And I mean, the list goes on and on. So. Uh, you know, I figured like we need to do something. We can't sit back as, you know, I, I couldn't anyways. Uh, I felt that there was more that I could do to, to get aware, not just awareness. I mean, I think awareness is great, but there's one thing of, of creating awareness. There's a totally other step when you want to start to offer support for these players, coaches, parents, whatever that may be. And so that's, you know, I started something called puck support, which is, uh, you know, we're a developing charity. We're going through all the paperwork. It's a long drawn out process. Uh, it can sometimes take up to a year to get all the paperwork in line, but you know, we're going through that process and I've had a ton of great support and like we have a clothing line. So mental health over hockey, and I don't know if you know this, but every single piece of clothing will have a, a name hidden inside. So on this one is Preston Grant, who was a, a kid who overdosed. In my hat, I have my old coach, Quentin Van Horlick, who took his own life in 2014. Um, and I mean, the list goes on. There's there's over 30 names in our database, ranging from men, women, uh, minor hockey players. There's a story of Nick and Jack Savage, two brothers, 16 and 18 years old, both overdosed and died in the same night. Hockey players at a party uh, down in the States. A lot of people don't hear about all these stories. We hear of the NHL guys and the pro guys, but unfortunately it's happened in the, the minor hockey community as well. And there's another one here, Ryan Donaldson, who was drafted by the Kelowna Rockets, and I've since become very good friends with his parents. He took his own life. Uh, he's in the clothing. He's best friends with Jake Vertanen growing up, and so Jake's been a supporter. The Canucks are all on board, and uh, I don't know if you know Real Kipper at noon, Nick Kiprios' yep. show uh, with Doug McLean. Doug McLean was wearing all of our gear the other day, which was that. really cool. Awesome. Yeah, and gave us a shout-out. So um, the clothing line is one small part of it. it it's about – Creating awareness, uh, but we also have somebody that's, uh, you know, virtually on call 24 hours a day um, to offer support to the players and, and and offer counseling. We also have a counselor coming on board and we're trying to, you know, partner with different treatment centers uh, and hopefully one day have our own center, our own academy, our own way of um, offering in-house support because, I know I'm kind of talking a lot here, but I know from my experience and, and, you know, as hockey players, as high level hockey players were, especially in Canada, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to look at it without sounding e egotistically, we're treated different and, you know, we're given special favors or whatever that is. And, and you go right from, you know, major junior, 16 years old, you blow out your knee and you need an MRI. You're getting it done that night or early the next day like that. Whereas, you know, people that aren't afforded that opportunity, well, they might have to wait six months a year or whatever that is. And so what I found is that, you know, because you're treated like that for so long and when you get that taken away, it can be really hard. And I think it can have some sort of positive effect being, you know, transitioned in the real world, but it's hard. And so being able to offer support to not only the players, but the coaches, I know there's a lot of coaches that struggle as well. Um, and then hockey parents with questions and different things, uh, whether it's them going through it or their kids. And so I feel that when we can identify um, as a hockey player again um, and be supported by fellow hockey players, it has a, a much more profound effect than if you're getting lost in the system, going to some of these government funded places or whatever, not saying anything bad about them. I'm just saying, I, I feel, and from what I'm seeing, we've been able to be a lot more effective when we're able to relate it back to hockey for whatever reason, good or bad. So that's sort of the, the long and the short of what I have going on, but it's been, uh, it hasn't been easy, man. I've overdosed over 10 times. It's been also, a, I didn't tell you earlier, but you know, I spent at different times, if you 
calculate it all up like 11 months in a psych ward over different trips and, and different things. So a lot, a lot has gone on. I was sexually abused as a kid. You want to talk about walking into a dressing room and not telling guys what's really going on. Well, that's where it all kind of started is, is not being comfortable enough to, to share what was really going on with me at any point in my life. And so you try to sort of just mask that with whatever you can. And as a young kid, it was hockey and hockey was my outlet. It was my drug. It was my escape. And as we get older and introduced to different things we we find out that there's other alternatives than than playing hockey and um unfortunately i got pulled pulled into the path of almost least resistance where it's like okay and it was easier to take this and feel better instead of having to go out and work and skate and everything else and i just lost love for the game because i I fell in love with drugs or at least i thought i did and it just it literally took everything from me it would take all day to to get into it but um it's been a rough road and and i'm on the other side of it now and uh it's my greatest hope that through the podcast and through puck support and the support of all the the great people who are involved um, that we can start to save lives and, and, and support those that maybe have lost loved ones in the hockey community or that are currently struggling. So, um, it's been, it's been fun, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's a challenge every single day to have to deal with the different messages and, and different people pulling me in different directions that need support. And, uh, there's just not enough time in every single day, but we're doing our best. Well, I think too, when you, when you start something like this, right, you, you have the best intentions, obviously of, of being, you know, supportive and, and being around and being there for guys and girls that need to talk. But I'm sure for you, once you got doing this, it's like almost letting the air out of a balloon. Once, you know, you got a couple little squeaks coming out and then once you let go of those fingers, it's, uh, I'm sure you're getting bombarded with emails and, and, uh, and messages and all that stuff just with people wanting to share their story with you or wanting to talk to you. So I think it is like the puck support that you put together is, unbelievable. And I think that, you know, and even if you just quickly, can you rhyme off some of the people that you've got, even as your ambassadors, I was looking the other day and I mean, you've got like, and even your lineup on your podcast, like you've got a, a lister of, of hockey guys and girls on your podcast, man. So even if you want to name a couple, just so people have a bit more of a context of kind of what you're doing and, and who you've got involved with what you're doing as well. Yeah. So, I mean, from starting with puck support, I mean, we got uh, just a ton of great people on board. We're talking Brent Sopel and uh, Darren McCarty, uh, Danny Probert, Bob Probert's wife um, has become a very close ally and friend of mine. And uh, for everybody in Ontario, the, a lot of people know that they do the Bob Probert Memorial Ride every year down in Windsor. And so when she came on my podcast, that uh, she made me a promise that if I get my motorcycle license for a year, I get to ride Bob Probert's Harley in the, the Bob Probert Memorial Ride, which is just unbelievable. So the Probert family has been super supportive. Kyle Quincy, Dodie Wood, who was a, a tough guy in the NHL, uh, Gratz as well. And I mean, the list goes on. Gilbert Boulay and, uh, you know, I, I've Talked to Kelly Rudy. Uh, I got Michael Landsberg coming on my podcast uh, on that. Sunday. Awesome. Curtis yeah. Gabriel, current NHLer. He's been he's been in the lineup lately. He had another fight last night. He's been a, a become a good friend of mine and one of our ambassadors. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. And as far as from my podcast, uh, list, uh, man, I've been so lucky and uh, like I took a chance, right? And um, I was, you know, Doug McLean. Uh, we talked about him a little bit earlier, but he was probably the first bigger name that came on my podcast that really started to lend some credibility and he's become just an awesome uh, source of support. And if I need anything or if I need, you know, connections or anything, he's, he's always willing to help. So he, he was big, but uh, you know, so many guys, Sheldon Kennedy, Theron Fleury, Chris Nyland, uh, Doug Gilmore. I, I don't even know how I forgot to, uh, I forgot to mention <laughs> Doug Gilmore. He's become a, a very close friend and actually, um, he gave me a bunch of stuff and, uh, we're going to actually, my friend that's in trying to get into treatment right now, we have some money put aside in our mental health and addiction fund through puck support, the clothing, uh, we raise money through that. Like I'm not making any money from puck support at this time. It's more of a charity. Like I put in sometimes 16 hours a day into it and I'm not making a dollar off it. And I could easily pull money out of it for myself, but I'm just not there yet. I feel it needs to be going to other, other places, even though it's currently I'm struggling financially, but I'm not. 
this isn't about money. Nothing I do uh, is about money um, as far as this goes. Uh, but Doug Gilmore just, you know, donated a signed jersey that we're going to auction off uh, to raise money for for my friend's treatment coming up. Uh, Riley Cote has been on, and Terry Ryan's another ambassador yep. and friend, uh, former first rounder. I'm just trying to go through the list here. Uh, Ken Campbell, senior writer for the Hockey News, he did a great piece on me. And Alan May, PJ Stock. I mean, Brian Prop, Brian Kilray has been on my podcast, the most winning coach in junior hockey. Uh, so I've been very lucky, awesome. very lucky. Jim Thompson has become a good friend as well. And um, Brian Smolinski, who works at the NHL, I, I have a meeting with the NHL coming up surrounding puck support. It's it's amazing. And I've also had a couple Paralympians on my podcast as well. The captain of the Paralympic team, Tyler McGregor, has become a friend and ambassador. He'll be uh, an ambassador here in the in the near future. And Paul Rosen, and so gold medalist with the Para team. And that's sort of another avenue of puck support that doesn't get talked about a lot because we're new, but. It's not just for able-bodied hockey. We're, we're going to have branches of para hockey and uh, blind hockey. And, and, you know, if you, you play hockey at any level, um, you don't have to be a pro to, to be part of this. It's sort of the, the beauty of it. And it's not like you have to try out, you know, to be get support. Um, but we have a campaign, Puck Sport Warriors, and it's sort of something that's on the side. We haven't put a lot of time into it again because it's pretty much me that's doing everything. And I just I'm trying my best, but I'm not I'm not a social media guy. I don't know how to run <laughs> social media. I don't know how to hashtag really. And every time I get a big following on one page, some bullies end up, you know, reporting my page and getting it taken down because they don't you know, they don't like what I'm doing or I don't know what the hell it is, but people want to hate on it. And sometimes and I just keep going forward. So, um, yeah, it's interesting, though. It, it's been Listen, man, it gets me out of bed every single day and it keeps me out of my own head and um, talk about rough times. Like it wasn't just a little bit of Coke or some pills for me. It was, you know, using a needle, you know, every 10 minutes when I could in my addiction for years and years, my arms are all scarred. I look like a, you could tell if I don't, if I have a t-shirt on, you can certainly tell that I was a drug addict there. There's, they're slowly healing, but um Hopefully tattoos will cover that up in the near future. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Definitely. Um, you know what? The, the one thing that you mentioned there that I want to highlight is, you know, not uh, taking money right now and not, you know, and doing it for, I think the one thing that again resonated with me is I see this as you starting your own business. This is a kind of you starting a small business, which if you've talked to anybody and I'm sure, you know, many people that have started a business, it's not easy. You know, doing a podcast, everyone feels like, oh yeah, just grab some gear, grab your phone and do a podcast. And that's fine. You can do one, two, 10 episodes, 20 episodes. When you get to 50 episodes, a hundred episodes, it's a grind and it's a fun grind, but you know, you're scrambling to get a guest or, oh my God, I got the podcast out, especially when you're doing it on your own and I can feel it. I, I do the same thing. I edit my own podcast. I put them up online. Like, you know, you're, you're scrambling to get all that stuff done. And I think, you know, the one thing that I've known that I've noticed in my business is if I don't do things for the money. Yes, we all need to make a little bit of money to pay our bills and stuff. But at the end of the day, if you do the right thing, you know, things will happen the right way. And even the posts and stuff, like who cares if you get five likes, 10 likes, a hundred likes, if 10 of those people love what you do, that's perfect. Like that's amazing. Even, you know, anytime I've ever gone live on a uh, YouTube or anything like that, if I get five people watching, I'm pumped. That means five people are engaged and want to ask questions or want to do something. If I get 500, that's amazing. You know, but I, I, I happen to watch your, your live on the weekend on Sunday um, with, with your buddy. And it was, it was awesome, man. Like I was, I was teared up a couple of times, like just getting choked up. And the one thing I want to get into now is I, I get choked up a little bit because I'm, I'm a, I'm a parent. I've got young kids. I've got an eight year old son and a seven year old daughter. And, um, I've already, you know, managed to get them from zero to eight, which I'm, I'm quite proud of, but they're still very young. So I think a lot for a lot of parents, like, okay, well, how do I get my kid to 10? to 11, to 12, to 15, to 18, to 20, without number one, messing them up myself by making some bad decisions, by not saying no enough or saying yes too much or let, giving them too much. Um, you know, and for you, I guess, going back to like childhood, I know that you had a trauma as, as a young child, uh, but when you look back on it now, kind of as an adult and, and, and as a father too, like, what do you see right now kind of in, in, in your childhood? Like with that, that, that trauma must have definitely kind of changed your path a little bit, I'm sure and probably changed probably how you were socially and things like that. If you look back on it, right? Oh, hundred percent. I think we, you know, I talk about it on my podcast with Curtis Gabriel and uh, shout out to one of my sponsors, pride tape. And so nice. uh, just standing for equality uh, in, in the game of hockey and, and, you know, so I'm not gay by any means, but I'll tell you what, I was sexually abused by an older man. And so, 
what that did at five and six years old is extremely confusing. Um, it's, it's scary and you don't really know how to feel about it. And right around that time, you know, seven, eight years old, uh, we start to hear different, you know, slurs on the playgrounds in the dressing rooms. And I would see how uh, some kids would get labeled as, you know, whatever, even whether it was true or it wasn't, and it stayed with them and they get made fun of and everything else. And so when I started to understand that, I was like, well, there's no way I'm ever going to tell anybody what happened to me because if people find out, you know, my life will be ruined and and everything else. And so I, I really just, you know, buried it. And who knows if I even make it as far in hockey as if I, as I did, if I, that doesn't happen to me because, you know, I used hockey as my outlet and uh, that's what I did to, to take myself out of it. And it was, you know, it didn't matter if I had friends around ice time. It didn't matter. I was out there with my rollerblades doing my own commentary, playing by myself, playing with both teams, always deals with hockey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always back this way, you know, <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what, what else my, is from like my dad's point of view, my mom and dad were split and I lived with my dad like 95% of the time. And he's a firefighter and just an unbelievable guy. He scouts for the Saskatoon blades now and, uh, very, um, connected in hockey as well now. And so, you know, I, I think he did all the best that he could, um, going back to, to me being a parent now and, and things that we can do for our parent or for our kids. I think, you know, finding that balance of, of when to say yes, when to say no, and really making kids work for it. I think, especially when it comes to hockey and I'm not talking about just hockey, I'm talking about, you know, you want something you need to, you need to learn how to work for it, whether that's doing stuff around the house, uh, improving your grades, whatever that is where, you know, not throwing it all into, into one one thing and letting them get away with stuff just because they play hockey or, or whatever that looks like. And so, you know, I, I think things were a little too easy for me uh, looking back on it uh, with respects to life outside of hockey. Like even when I, you know, had to move away from home or whatever, you know, my dad's buying me a car cause I needed a car and, Oh, I, didn't have to have a summer job because I was training in the off season when realistically you're training for two hours a day, you sure as damn well, you could get a part-time job. And I think every kid at that age should have a part-time job because what that's going to do is one, it's going to, you're going to learn how to respect the workplace a little bit more and what it really takes. And I think if anything, it's going to push you even harder to want to play hockey and be like, Hey, if I got a chance here, I better figure out what I'm going to do to, to push myself to that next level, because I don't want to do this crappy job for the rest of my life or whatever. And that's no disrespect to anybody out there in the workforce doing a job providing for your family. But I, I think when you don't know, uh, and you don't have that experience. And then all of a sudden you're done playing hockey, whether it be after junior or a, a pro career. And um, I know Brent Sopel won't mind me talking about this because he's a, he's one of my good, good friends. We talk multiple times throughout the week and, you know, he's never had a job in his life. He's still trying to really find a job. He just got his first job and um, he's really struggling. Like, you know, Stanley cup winner. And uh, he has some other barriers as well. He battles own addiction and, and different dyslexia and stuff like that, that he hid for a long time. But, you know, you talk about a guy that, you know, he plays hockey your whole life and he had a long career in the NHL. And now he's feeling like, what the hell do I do? He has no idea what that looks like. And so I think for any parents out there um it's hard man it's there's no easy answer there's no manual on parenting we all know that uh but making sure that kids are are staying you know level and and not just thinking about hockey having those real life experiences outside of hockey like you know if and when my kid get to the junior level and they want to train in the off season. Okay. Well, you're going to get a part-time job. You're going to help pay for this training, regardless if I had $10 million in the bank or not, it's so that they can start to appreciate, you know, what it takes to, to provide for whatever they need, you know, gas, insurance, whatever, like, and I understand that like, maybe in some cases you have to do these things for your kids to maybe they need a car cause they need to go and play junior. But I'll tell you, I played junior and I, there's years I didn't have a car in Saskatchewan. I was just fine. Enough guys had cars. We made it happen. The team will make it happen. They'll get you to the rink. Um, I think kids in hockey have it too easy outside of hockey, 100%. And um, kid parents are 
kids use it to their advantage too. Oh, I can't do that. Cause I got to train. I got to yeah. focus on my hockey and everything totally. else. But what we're, I think what we're all missing is the piece outside of hockey and how much it's going to translate into life after hockey, but also life during hockey by giving them ex- that experience of having to go to work and do something you don't want to do um, to, to get something that you want or need, like, you know, paying for your training or paying for your gas, or, you know, you want to go out to the movies with your friends and you're 16 years old. Well, I guess you better get a job because why the hell am I going to pay for it all for you? It's not doing these kids any favors. It's really not. You, the, the sooner we, I believe the sooner we teach them about money management, um, own responsibilities, making sure their rooms clean, their beds made, whatever that looks like. Um, and having respect, um, for money and, and for, you know, your parents' house or whatever, and trying to explain to them and show them really what it takes to, to provide. And a lot of kids take it for granted. You know, they show up to the rink and they're whatever. And they just, they don't have no idea that they got like what a $400 stick is really yeah. worth in their hands and they're smashing it against the boards and they got $1,200 skates on and their helmets. I mean, never mind all the ice times and the extra coaching and everything and trying to find a way to, to make kids appreciate that and somehow contribute um, to their own success by whatever that looks like. Uh, it might be different for everybody, but I think that could have a profound effect. Um, but yeah, for me, it was definitely too easy. My dad gave me, you know, everything I, I needed, wanted um, to the point where he'd go into debt and everything else. And just like a lot of parents and uh, it translated into my older life. Like I didn't know what to do. I'd rely on my dad through my addiction. I took over a hundred thousand dollars from my dad in one year, just making him excuses, relying on him, whatever, because I had no concept of what it took outside of, you know, away from him. You know, he did everything for me, he gave me everything. I never learned how to do anything because I never had to. Yeah. And it's not his fault. You know, he's just trying to do the best he can, but you ask me and I'm going to tell you, like, you know, that's the, probably the best thing we can do for our kids is to understand, make them understand that, you know, you got to learn to fend for yourself because I'm, you know, we're not always here for you. And I'm not talking at eight, nine, 10 years old, but by the time they're 15, they best have a job. Like I seriously. totally agree. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think like, I think for any parent right now that, that has young kids, we want our kids to have a better life than we had. We want them to have, you know, not, not to want for anything. And especially if you've come from a bit of a tough upbringing, you want to make sure that, they, that you know, and, but I think to your point, we still need to teach them how to be responsible, how to appreciate the dollar, how to appreciate, man, mom, dad spent $400 on this. They could have got a hotel room and went on a little nightly vacation and said, we bought you a hockey stick. That's crazy, you know, and we'll do it, but you gotta, you know, and I, I totally agree. I think they need some skin in the game, whether it's, they understand what it is. They're good kids. They work. They maybe they have a part-time job. They do chores around the house, whatever that is. Uh, but I think that is, I think that is massive, man, for sure. Now, I don't want to dwell on this, but, and we'll move forward on this, but did you ever tell anybody about, about the abuse or anything like that? Like, was that ever when you were young or did you kind of bury it all the way through until, you know, until kind of like, did I, so I, I guess what I'm getting at is would your dad have had any inklings of it or your mom, um, as far as just like you've been different or, and, and I guess the, what I'm kind of wrapping this around is as a parent, you know, is there any red flags that, that you would see as far as you know, if you think back on how you were before and after, did you, you know, were you a lot more quiet? Did you not want to go to so-and-so's house? Did you, you know what I mean? Was there anything like that that kind of stood out a little bit or not really? Yeah. So it, for me personally, it was, it was a really challenging experience because, and for my parents, I mean, it's because my mom left my dad the day or two days before my fifth birthday. And so, you know, I, obviously they had, attributed everything to that. And then I was abused shortly after that. I think, you know, I went on this family vacation with my mom's side of the family and this guy took advantage because my dad wasn't there. My dad was there. Probably wouldn't happen. I'm not blaming anybody. It happened. I'm not, it's whatever. Um, but I asked people, um, now, especially even before I came out with it, um, you know, did you notice a change around the time I was five and, and six, I would ask. And, and they'd be like, yeah, like, you know, you became a lot more angry and temperamental and throw temper tantrums and uh, just, you know, I would cry a lot. And I was just, I was really angry. Like the the way that I acted as a kid, man, was I a bad kid on the ice. I, I, you know, I did some horrible things to my dad, to other players, to everything. So uh, definitely there's red flags, but I think what even all the other parents, you know, who I've talked to with my friend's parents growing up, you know, they all just attributed to my mom leaving, you know, and, yeah. and that had a big thing. So they didn't really know, sure. um, you know, so they blame, they didn't, they wouldn't have really known. And so, 
you know, going back to what I said earlier about these homophobic slurs. So like when I was really little, I started to think that I was gay, not because I was ever attracted to men, but I was like, Oh my God. Like I, you know, was sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. To this to me, but from a guy. Yeah. So that makes me gay. Right. So I remember when I was like in grade eight, I had this girlfriend from grade eight to grade 12, uh, you know, great, great girl still to this day. She's, she's gone on to do amazing things and my high school sweetheart, and, and she's just a really nice person and we were best friends. And so I actually felt comfortable enough to tell her. Um, I remember one new year's, I was kind of like one of the first times that I was really, really drunk and uh, not the first time, but one of the first times. And I remember just like telling her, I was like, Natalia, like, I think I'm gay. Like, because I was like still yeah. trying to like, you know, trying to get it to out that, Hey, like I, this happened to me or whatever. And so I just remember me and she's like, thought I was, and I was like, I'm just joking. Like, cause I wasn't, but I was trying to tell her that this happened to me. And so like, I remember I talked to her about it. I don't know, last year about this time. And she's like, Oh, I would have had no, no idea. And she didn't really remember me telling her that, but to answer your questions, like I didn't tell anybody, not until I was 26 um, was the first time I ever told anybody. And the real first time that I started to deal with it was, you know, about officially start dealing with it about, you know, just under a year ago, started to get sexual abuse, trauma counseling, and which I'm still active in. And, you know, we're starting a group up here soon. Uh, but as far as the red flags go, I mean, yeah, there's red flags, but everybody was just chopping it up to my mom leaving and, and everything else. So there was definitely a drastic change in my behavior. And, you know, looking back, my dad obviously wishes he would have dug a little deeper and do more, but here he is a single dad of two kids at 33 years old. How that's how old I am now when my mom left and a fireman working extra time, night shifts, day shifts, coaching hockey, coaching my sister's baseball, just trying to survive financially and everything else else and keep up and keep his car running, whatever that is, totally. gas in the car. So there was yeah. no extra time for, for him to even think about that. It was, I just remember watching my dad, I can still picture just how exhausted he was and not having any sort of appreciation or knowledge as a kid of what he was going through as a single parent, doing everything he could for not only me to play hockey, but for me to pretty much do whatever I wanted to do. He was always the dad picking me and my friends up or dropping me and my friends off at, you know, extra ice times or the BMX track or the skateboard park, whatever it was I wanted to do. My dad was always there. So, you know, I think there was an ample opportunity for, for me to, to tell him, of course, but I would have never told my dad that because I always wanted to be Mr. You know, I impressed my dad and, and I knew it didn't, I don't know. I just, lots of red flags, but I think people attribute it to my mom leaving. And so I would suggest to any parents that if you are noticing something different in your kid, dig a little deeper because there's probably something there. It doesn't mean they've been sexually abused. That's not what I'm saying, but whether it be bullying at being bullied at school or in the dressing room, or, you know, they they have some sort of undiagnosed mental illness, or we call it emotional wellness in children, but things creeping in where, you know, it's okay to ask them questions and we should be asking our kids the hard questions and educating them on the hard issues. I truly believe it. If you, the old, the old way of parenting and living is like, Oh, hush, hush. We're not going to talk about this. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to let these kids figure it out on their own. Well, what? Yeah. Like, <laughs> what if you just left your kid out in the world at three years old and said, good, good luck. Go get a house, go get a, yeah. you know, provide for yourself and everything else. Like we nurture our kids all the way through, but then there's certain things that we don't want to talk about because it's uncomfortable or whatever. And that goes back to sex and everything else too, because you know, I never had that talk as a kid. Like I only heard little tidbits in school of like what was right, what was wrong. And by that time it was, you know, past the point that, you know, I was really willing to talk because of like what we talked about earlier with all the things going on in the playground and everything else. But I mean, man, like it's get involved in, in and talk to your kids. And, and if any parents are listening, any players are listening, like I got two girls pregnant at the same time when I was playing major junior hockey. And that's not because I was that guy. They were both my girlfriends at different times. And I really, I was like one of the least amount of guys like that on my team. And just so happened that I got these two girls pregnant and you know, I remember getting the talk every single year um, in Swift Current, in Kelowna, you know, you know, here, you know, this is what could happen and everything else. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen to me and everything else. But, you know, making sure that, you know, you're staying on top of your kids and, and everything that they're doing. I mean, who are they hanging out with? 
And what are they watching? Like, what are they focusing their energy on? If you notice a drastic change in them, I mean, you're not always going to be able to intervene and change it. I mean, kids and, and people are going to do, you know, what feels right to them sometimes. But I think at a certain age, they don't even know what feels right. I know I didn't. And I was just trying to fit in, trying to figure out who I was. And, um, you know, there was a lot of different times where, where different things were going on. And I was just trying different things to feel better. And, yeah. you know, but the hard conversations, man, when you want to talk about educating your kids on, on the power of drugs and alcohol and, and, and safe sex and, and th- those kind of things, um, it's, it can, it can really um, make a difference. Whereas I think it's more dangerous to not have those conversations as uncomfortable as it's going to be for, for you, for them, for whatever. And you want to hope that, okay, well, it won't be my kid that's going to go through depression. It's not going to be my kid that's addicted to alcohol or this or that. Well, guess what? I'm here to say that it can happen to anybody. Um, you don't need to be sexually abused to become an addict. You don't need to, um, just sometimes things happen and going back to the bullying is something I really want to touch on because it's going on a lot these days, especially even more with social media and these, you know, these Twitter warriors and Instagram warriors that hide behind fake names. And I get a lot of it too. Somebody making an account, Brady Leavold still does heroin. And it's like, okay, like, you know, you don't even know me for one. Like I get drug tested once a week and, you know, I'm, I'm proud that I'm clean today. And I always told my listeners, if I relapse, I'll be the first to tell you because there's going to be more value in that showing my vulnerability. And I know I knew the second that I started that podcast and I started sharing my story, the second that I wasn't honest, the second that I started to lie about anything, you lose all credibility. Yeah. You, and, and I, and you know what I mean? And it's not even about the credibility at first. That's what it was for me. But now it's like, okay, you know what? People are resonating with you because they've gone through their own struggles and and they're looking to you. So I think, you know, relapse can be part of story. It certainly has been for me in the past. Luckily not this time around. And I'm grateful for that, but it's always right around the corner. I know that I I don't feel it ever coming on in this last year. I can't even tell you, I feel like that stuff never happened to me. Um, But if you think that you're, you or your kids are above addiction um, or alcoholism on any, any form, you know, open your eyes, open your eyes, open your ears, open your hearts and understand that this is something that can truly happen to anybody and it doesn't happen overnight. So, you know, if you notice signs, if you notice things going on, you know, it's, it's never going to hurt. You're not going to do more damage by asking and and being more involved. I I truly believe that. Are you going to piss your kids off and annoy them a little bit? Sure. But you're, you're you're their parents. That's what you're supposed to do. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I think, I think to your point, I think it starts young too. Right. And, and if you haven't started at four five, six years old and start now, whether they're 14, 15, like you said, yeah, you're going to be uncool. Your parent, your kids are going to tell you you're a nerd. Quit asking me stupid questions. But I know we went through it with my little guy who's in, in school his first year, four years old, like school, like the bus, everything was fine. And then one day comes home, doesn't want to go to school anymore. And second day, doesn't want to go to school anymore. And like this happened for a couple of days in a row. So we started asking questions and just, you know, what's going on, buddy? Like, what's how's the bus ride? How's school? How are your buddies? And, and sure enough, come to find out that a little guy on the, on the bus was like an older kid was like grabbing his hat and just playing around with them probably. And I'm not saying bullying because bullying to me is like such a cliche bad word. And so I yeah. addressed it with the, with, with the, um, with the school and just said, I'm not saying this is bullying at all. It's just a young kid. He's four years old. So I don't know what the story is, but they nipped it right away. And sure enough, everything changed. He was fine and they changed seats and it was all good, but it was just a young kid didn't know, you know, but had we not asked those questions, we would have probably battled with him all year. Not saying this would have scarred him or anything, but I'm just saying like, to your point about bullying and all this stuff and having those hard conversations. Now that was an easy conversation. He's four years old. It's not a big deal, but I'm hoping that by having these conversations with our kids at younger ages, that it's easier when they're 14, 15 for them to come home and say, Hey dad, somebody, you know, sucker punched me on the bus. Like what? Okay. Well this is, let's, let's, let, let, let's walk through this. Let's see how we can deal with this, you know? And, uh, and I think the other big thing with, with that as well is as parents, don't be judgy. Don't snap on your kids right away. You know, I remember the first speeding ticket I ever got, you know, I got my license probably for a week and I'm sure you were similar, just like, let's go. And first speeding ticket I got, I remember I came through the front door and first person I went to was my mom and I said, mom, I got a speeding ticket. She's like, okay, what what happened? Like, you know, I had to pay it. It was all on me, but I had no problem coming to tell her because I knew I wasn't going to get grounded. I wasn't going to get the car taken away. I wasn't going to get threatened. It was just, I made a mistake. How do you fix it? I had a solution. I'm going to pay for it. It was only, you know, whatever, but having those open lines of communication, I think is massive and it's not easy to do that, you know? And I think that's, that's a really, really, really big piece. And like you said, asking those tough questions sometimes and being a, being a nerd parent or that annoying parent sometimes is part of our job. Like, you know, we're not, we're not put on this earth to be 
our, our kids' best friends. We're here to make sure that we can guide them through this, you know, cumbersome life that they're going to have to live. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just want to add to, I know like being the nerd parent, um, you know, it's not always the, the most rewarding job or, or that you're not going to be the cool parent all the time. But I, I listen, I, I know there's a lot of parents out there that will buy their kids alcohol. And I know my dad did it different. My dad, the only time my dad ever did it for me was on my grad night, um, which was whatever. But there's a lot of parents out there that, you know, allow their kids to smoke weed at, you know, 16 or 17. And at the end of the day, you can't really stop them if they're going to leave the house and do it. But same with drinking. Uh, but don't provide this stuff for your kids. Don't, you know, don't make it easy for them to, to get their hands on it. You're never going to stop them from trying and experimenting and everything else. And you hear the old saying, Oh, I'd rather them do it under my roof and this and that. And listen, I get it. I understand that side of it too. But the fact that you're showing them that it's okay uh, and that you're going to, you know, co-sign their experimenting or whatever. For me, I think that can be really dangerous. It's something that I didn't really happen for me. I always had to hide that kind of stuff or I didn't hide it. I just never even bothered asking my dad because he knew, I knew he would say no, he was against it. And like, I'm not saying, okay, well, look what happened to me. It's not like that it had a profound effect on my life. Um, didn't save me, but alcohol was never really my problem at different times it was because that was what was readily available and and everything else and the first sort of thing we all start get introduced to but you know i just i'm very against that and i don't think that parents should be involved in, in that sort of behavior with their kids at at any time before they're before they're 19 you know you want to have a beer with your son on his 19th birthday or your daughter on 19th and take them out by all means they're an adult but before that I really believe that as parents, we need to assert ourselves as, as the parent, not the friend. Um, and it's not always easy. <laughs> oh, for sure. No, I totally agree. And I, I kind of echo what you're saying. I think uh, having a safe house and, you know, I, I remember when we were probably, my brother was probably 17, 18, came home, you know, ha, you know, half in the bag. And I remember my parents being like, you know, kind of my parents drank, they, they know, they knew they weren't stupid, you know, but it was a conversation and it was a heavy conversation with my brother about, you know, being smart, not, you know, picking his spots, you know, and all that stuff, but it was an open conversation, which was, and we were not angels by any means, but I think we never had my parents go to the liquor store for us or the beer store. So I was very similar to you. They, I didn't ask, they, they were against it. We, and I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of other ways to find booze. Right. But I also sure. didn't feel like I couldn't talk to my parents about my yep. buddy puking and man, we were in a bad spot. Can you come pick us up? You know, I always felt that I could talk to them. They, yeah, they'd be disappointed. And that's something I have to, I have to deal with, but I didn't feel like it was, um, we were going to get kicked out of the house for, you know what I mean? And I think that was really important too, just to be able to have a safe place to talk and, and, and be, you know, yeah. um, cause you're right. We're going to experiment, man. As kids, we all did. Our kids are going to do the same thing. And I think now with, you know, marijuana being legal and other things that we probably don't even really know the, ram the ramifications of marijuana fully, you know, for young kids taking it yet and, and what the long-term effects are, you know, I think it's something that we got to be aware of and definitely, you know, keep an eye out for our, for our young kids for sure. Yeah. Well, and going back, I just want to talk about marijuana for a minute because when I first started my podcast, I mentioned that I celebrated a year of, you know, I don't even call it sobriety because for the first year I, I abused marijuana to get off, not to get off of, but cause I was off of it, but to transition into this life without having to use the hard drugs. And you have to understand my addiction was bad. Like the, even the most seasoned addicts on downtown Vancouver's East side, they'd be like, what's wrong with you? Are you trying to die? Like these people have been <laughs> really? down there 20 years and they didn't even use on the scale I was using. I was like, yeah, I am. Like I didn't care to live and I just, whatever. And so I did, I use, you know, marijuana and I know it's a little more prevalent in the hockey community and, uh, Guys now, even in the NHL, I know they're using it instead of having beers after the game. They a lot of guys I know get together and, and they might have a little communal smoke or something. And I don't, I'm not advocating for it. I, I don't think it's great at all. Um, but just as the reason I brought it up is because if anyone's listening to my older episodes of my podcast, I'm very open about that and how I was, you know, using um, cannabis and different things. Uh, but I'm no longer doing that. It's been two months um, since I've smoked and I feel a million times better. I thought it was helpful. Thing, and maybe it did help me get to where I needed to be, um, but I don't do it anymore. However, what I do do is I microdose mushrooms and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. I know 
uh, Gratz is in it. And the reason why it was yeah. directed to me is uh, because of concussions. You know, yeah. I had a lot of concussions um, from hockey and also from outside of hockey. I had a really bad one. I got hit with a bat over the head when I was on the street in Vancouver, really bad concussion. And, uh, you know, so actually going to be on uh a major sports network is doing a documentary on, on a bunch of players that microdose for their concussions. And so it's something that I, I tell people about, but also at the same time, it's not legal. So it's sort of, sort of one of those gray areas, like where, where marijuana was a few years back. Um, but it's certainly trending towards the legal aspect, but I know that there's a lot of um, young hockey players out there that are hearing about this um, and, and thinking about doing it. And I would just advise them all to, to just stay in your lane and, you know, just, just do it the, the natural way as much as possible. And if, you know, you play a long uh, career of hockey and you think that you have concussion, post concussion problems and, and, you know, different things, well, then maybe it's a time to, to address it. But just for anybody listening to my podcast, and if you hear me talking about that, it's certainly that I, something that I'm not advocating for younger players to do. It's, it's 19 plus 100%. Um, and as far as the marijuana goes, it's going to slow you down. Um, you know, you want to, a lot of guys drink uh, to, to deal with their anxiety and depression and different things makes it worse. Uh, in my opinion, marijuana is no different. Um, there's healthy alternatives uh, to managing these uh, different things that people have going on. So uh, it's, it's all about, you know, just looking for the best possible way to, to learn your own self. And I think with all the things that are going on, and I don't know how much you talk about it with your players, but the mental side of the game and, and ways of dealing with anxiety and, and pressure and uh, the ups and downs of hockey, like, holy cow, this, this, it's a crazy and it happens on all levels. Like a guy will be, it's not like you wake up, I wake up tomorrow and I'm any worse at hockey than I was yesterday. You know, guys yeah. go on this terror, they're playing and they're on fire and maybe something happens off the ice that nobody really knows about or something's going on in anything. Uh, and then all of a sudden they'll go like eight or nine games with no points or whatever that is. And it's not because their skill got any better, but I think there's, there's so many things out there nowadays um, to help with the mental side of the game. And for parents out there, you want to invest in your kids um, and, and not just, we're not just talking hockey. You want to invest in your kids. You're paying all this money for hockey, all this money for training, start to find some training for their mental side of the game. And it's going to transition to their life outside of hockey as well. Um, people talk about it all the time. Oh, the mental edge of the game, we got to do this and that. But my question is, cause I'm kind of disconnected from the coaching side of hockey and where the kids are at. I've done a little bit. I, I know some guys that run programs and different programs that are out there, but I'm wondering on your side of it, like, how much are you seeing kids that are coming to the rink and, and focusing on anything other than just in the gym or on the ice? Like what's going on that's, with all that? Yeah. And that's probably 90% of it, right. Is, is working out or skill sessions. And um, we talk a lot about the mental side of the game and just understanding the game of hockey better, learning how to deal with adversity, whether that's chirps in the locker room or cause I, the other thing too, I think, you know, and you've been around locker rooms your whole life. So have I, um, if you don't know how to deal with somebody telling you a nice haircut, a hey, good shirt, buddy, would you steal that from your mom? And some guys crumble in a second, right? And if you don't know how to deal with that, or you haven't had family or buddies or friends or coach that can help you deal with that at younger ages, you're going to have a hard time going through not just hockey, but life, right? So I think those are all big things. And we really try to work with our young players on just being a good player, number one, you know, and, and you've talked about this a lot in your podcast. So have I is changing the culture. I went into my first year of college was forced to drink, went to a rookie party. It sucked. When I got out of my freshman year, I said, there's no way we're doing that to our rookies next year. And we changed the culture. And from that point on, not just me, but our group of guys from that point on rookie party was a blast. The rookies loved it. The older guys got involved. We went and cheered at the volleyball game. Like we still drank and had fun and did stupid stuff, but it was awesome. And I, I, and I, I did it in pro same thing. Like I'm not going to treat a rookie the way I was treated. Why is this 14 year old pro giving me the gears? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where to sit. I don't know what to touch. I don't know what to do. Why don't you help me rather than carve me every time I do something wrong? You know what I mean? So changing that culture a little bit is huge. So for these young kids that we deal with it, that's the mental part of the game. Be a leader, man. And not everyone's going to be your Sidney Crosby captain or your Mark Messi captain, but you can be a leader. You can be a leader to that skittish kid that's coming in that just moved in from West Vancouver into Vancouver and doesn't know anybody. You can help that kid out, you know? So I think that's a big, big part of it as well. But to your point, man, like, 
spending time going to maybe seeing a sports psychologist or even going online and there's a ton of good programs just online that you can work on worksheets and do different things. You know, I think you're right. Like the, to me, the mind is a muscle and we need to, you know, we need to develop it, whether that's reading books, listening to podcasts, going, doing yeah. mental gym work. Like I think it, I think it's huge, you know, and on the flip side of that, what you're going through, I had a father that went through some mental illness. It's really, really, really hard when you have a family member and I'm just talking as somebody who's, who wasn't the person going through it, but the outsider as a family member, you treat them like they're normal. I'm sure a lot of times your dad, mom, aunts, uncles are like, come on, buddy, seriously, snap out of it. This is so immature. What are you doing? You're wrecking everything. You're screwing up your family, but we don't look at it. Like he's got a broken arm. He's got a cast on. I'm not going to go punch him in the arm. Right. But he's got a broken brain and we were telling him, put your boots back on, buddy. Come on. You, what are you doing? And when my dad went through it, it was really hard. I think for my younger sister and myself at times too, we're like, like, dad, let's go, man. Come on, man. Like, you know, and after, you know, getting help from doctors and, and understanding him more, like his brain's broken. He's got a cast on his brain right now. We need to help him. We need to like handle him a little bit more with white gloves and, you know, and it's really, really hard as an outsider seeing that. I can't imagine what it's like to go through it as, as you know, you did as far as just getting all that. And I'm sure in your head, you're like, you're right. I should just put my boots on. I should just be able to snap out of this. And then opportunity arises to go have another drink or go have another needle or whatever that is. You're like, oh, be, oh, I'm going to do that. Just one more, just one more. You yeah. Know? And, no. and it's, I, I, so I, I, it just, it's one of those things. I think the brain is the mental part of life is so huge that we need to understand it better. We need to like, people are so quick to pass judgment. You see somebody walking weird in the mall and right away, you're like, oh, look at that guy. He can't even walk. Right. And meanwhile, you don't even know that that guy got a baseball bat to the head or had an injury at work or was a like whatever it is. Right. We just pass judgment right away. And I think that's something that we got to change that stigma and you know, how do we help people out and just having a bit op, more of an open mind to stuff I think is, is huge, you know? Um, but to back to your original question. Yeah. I think the mental part of the game on both sides, understanding it as an illness and working on us getting better and stronger mentally, I think is huge and is definitely neglected. I don't think we work on it nearly enough as, as you know, as much as we should. Sure. Yeah. And mentioned too, like learning uh, off the ice, you know, how, how can we understand the game better? And, you know, what are these great players? Like, what are they doing on the ice? And so like, what I always tell the kids now that I talk to and something that I didn't do is like, and I still can't really do it. I'm not playing anymore. So it doesn't matter to me as much, but when you're watching a game, like, you know, if you're a certain position, like you should be watching that position majority of the time, watching what they're doing, the little intangible and the things. And, you know, where are they on the ice? How are they anticipating? Like you could watch the game and, and I think it's great to learn all the positions. Obviously you got to watch it all because a certain guy might do this and it'll open up for you over here. I, I get that side of it too, but spending time and watching the great players, not just the way they're handling the puck or they're shooting the puck, but what are they doing away from the puck? And so I had a really good conversation with Dave Hunchak yesterday, who is my, my assistant coach in Swift Current um, and uh, just an unbelievable guy. And we were talking and, and he worked for the world junior team as a video coach when Crosby was on the world junior and uh, I asked him, I was like, well, who's the best, who's the best players you ever coach? And, you know, it was a loaded question because this guy's coached so many different guys. He obviously said Sid and, you know, we started to talk uh, just about, you know, the reasons why certain guys get drafted really high, you know, maybe in the first round in the NHL draft out of junior that never find that success outside of major junior. And, you know, we were talking about it and my take, and we have very much the same take on it is, you know, these guys that have are goal scorers or playmakers at junior, um, some of them can go on and be, you know, goal player, goal scorer and playmaker in, in pro like McDavid and Ovechkin, all these guys. But taking pride in the little things like getting pucks out, face offs, blocking shots, doing all the stuff that guys don't want to do and the stuff that doesn't get you credit for. And don't get me wrong, points definitely matter. Um, if you could do it all, then it's great. But I've seen a lot of guys that are still playing in the NHL now, uh, even in junior, that you would have never imagined playing for this long in the NHL. They're not top six forwards or top three defensemen or four defensemen on the team necessarily. But guess what? They've been playing the NHL for the last 10 years, making over a million bucks a year doing what they love. And so I think a lot gets gets lost and a lot of kids are trying to be the next Connor McDavid, which is great. I mean, I think, you know, of course we all want to be that, that great, but the reality is, is if you can kind of find your own niche and start to take pride and, and realize at a younger age that 
you know, if you can learn to do all the things that other people aren't focusing or willing to do, and you can learn how to do those things. Great. Well, guess what? You're going to have a, a very, very good chance of having a long pro career. If you already have that skill set, is what I'm saying, but I, I think it gets missed a lot. And, you know, I've talked to so many guys, Terry Ryan, same thing, Zach Hamill, I grew up with first round or seventh overall or whatever to Boston played a handful of games, Chris beach, another story, Gilbert Brule, another story, a friend of mine didn't play very long or he did, but kind of up and down. He wasn't the first line guy like he wanted to be. And, um, you know, they just never really realized the other side of the game that, that comes away from, you know, scoring and setting up goals or whatever. And I'm just talking about forwards. Um, but I mean, man, like there's so many things that people don't realize that they can be working on to get them to that next step. And it's the stuff that isn't necessarily going to get you noticed. And another thing too, to say is, these kids, man, they have no idea who's watching them. doesn't matter where they are. Like, you know, we could be, we could be coaching on, you know, we could be coaching together or something, or I could be coaching against you. Say I had a team, you had a team, we got a team of 12 or 13 year olds. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I have a good player on my team and, and, but he's, he's just an idiot on the ice or you see him in the lobby after the game and he's acting like an idiot, throws garbage on the ground, slams the door in somebody's face or has an attitude. Well, guess what? Now, five years from now, you're the head coach of an OHL team or, or a scout or whatever. These kids don't think people remember. Like I, I try to tell them like, wherever you go, just remember, like you don't know who's around might be one person in the rink, but that one person today might not be able to have a huge effect on your career, but maybe they're going to be somewhere down the road. So you want to remember that. And it, it oh, goes yeah. to be just represent yourself, but your team, your community, and certainly your family um, and, and starting to take pride in that where you go anywhere as a hockey player, anywhere you go, it might be an opportunity to further yourself in, in the game of hockey. And so people remember stuff and for the good reasons. And unfortunately, even more so for bad reasons, if you do something bad, it seems like negativity sticks around even longer than, than positivity. And uh, the hockey community, as I found out, I always knew it, but I'll tell you what, in this last year, man, holy cow, is it small. <laughs> it's crazy, right? It's nuts. Even, even us connecting on how many guys we crossed over with on who you've talked to, who you know that I, or who you've met over this course of this year. And probably before that, uh, it was nuts. I was like, holy man, like there was probably seven or eight guys that I had know really, really well. Like even Curtis Gabriel has trained here the last three years and skated with us and worked out with us and, uh, you know, great guy and obviously huge advocate for a lot of, you know, a lot of great causes and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it was, it's really, really small. You're right. So to your point, yeah, you got to really be careful, you know, and I, I say that with, you know, be yourself, have fun, you know, don't, yeah. don't, don't try to act differently than what you normally would, but just be a respectful person, man. Be a good person. Open a door. Say, please, thank you. It goes a long way. And that you're is. right. Those negative things follow you a lot longer than uh, scoring a hat trick and then going to throw your garbage out and slam the door in someone's face. That's going to stick a lot longer than the hat trick will for sure. Yeah, okay. it, it's true, man. And I think to, to go back to your point, I mean, yeah, just being yourself. I think the sooner we can all realize, you know, that it's okay, whatever, whoever we are, um, you know, as long as you're not be a complete dick and just a terrible person, but, you know, learning and, and being okay with who you are and the things that you like and the things that whatever you're interested in, you don't have to be what somebody else wants you to be. And, and so like, that goes back to what I said earlier is like, I was just always trying, it didn't matter where I was. I wasn't addressing him. If I was at school, if I was homeless, if I was in jail, I was always trying to do whatever I could to fit in. Okay. Like I was like a chameleon everywhere I'd go. I was just trying to, and all the while I had no idea who I really was. And so, you know, I think just being, being yourself um, and, and just having the mentality of doing the next right thing and doing, you know, the, the good thing and not always the easy thing. Sometimes it's hard, but when I think we get to a certain age and you know, we sh most of us know right from wrong. We're talking in the hockey community. If you're playing hockey, you usually come from not necessarily a great family or a family with money, but you're surrounded with, with usually good people. Hockey people are typically good people um, with good values and morals. And don't get me wrong. There's assholes everywhere. Let's be honest. <laughs> but um, the majority of people that I've found in, in hockey are, are fairly fairly good people and there's some amazing people. Um, but I think just, just following your heart and doing the next right thing, um, and not always looking out for yourself. And I know that's a loaded, loaded statement because you, you kind of have to look out for number one, especially in hockey. And, but trying to be that, you know, that teammate, uh, 
that picks up your teammates when they're having a hard time, making them feel comfortable talking with what you said earlier. Like if a guy gets traded to your team or a rookie comes up, gets called up, if you're in junior, like the hell you want to make his time a nightmare for? Like I got picked on when I got called up. I couldn't even look. I remember looking, I was at the front of the bus and I was 16 in Swift Current and I was I'm not going to name any names, but uh, the guy, one guy in particular is having a really hard time right now. And I've been talking to him, but man, he was such an asshole. Um, but I remember just looking back and I'm over it now. I'm trying to help him now. I played in the NHL for a long time, but, uh, I remember looking back and, and like, he's like, what the F you looking back here, rookie face the front of the bus. And then it's like, I couldn't even, I remember I couldn't even go take a pee at the back of the bus. Yeah. Like there was rules about that. Like you can't go past the vets. They're sleeping, whatever. Um, I remember coming like multiple times, man, like multiple times when I'm a rookie in Swift Current, like long road trip, whatever the lights are out. Cause you can't even, they turn the lights out cause we lost. They don't even give us power to the lights and I got to pee. You can't go to the bathroom and I'm like peeing in bottles. It's overflowing on me and everything. And you can't see. And Oh my God. And it's just, what a terrible feeling. I, I, that's when you wonder why I quit so many times. It was like, man, I just, I hated going to the rink sometimes because guys, they weren't very welcoming. They weren't supportive. They totally. weren't. Yeah. And more- I think, t- tell me anything of this, Brady. Like when I, when I look at that situation, I went through too. like in junior, I had a really good experience overall, but there was little thing, pockets here, pockets there, a little bit of hazing going on. And some guys dealt with it differently than I did. And I dealt with it differently than other people. And I think I got a question for you out of this as well, but the one thing I noticed though with this stuff, when you hear of like the hazing that went on in some OHL centers the last couple of years that have come out over you know, 10, 15 years ago and whatever that is. And I, and I, I get that was a long time ago. It's kind of weird and crazy that it's coming out now, but that, that that's fine. Right. The thing that I look at though, is where was the management? Where were the adults? Where were the coaches? Where were the like, who, why didn't one of those coaches or management step up and tell the, the in, in a simple situation, like, no, no, the bus is for everybody. You know, you can go to the back of the bus. I heard about, you know, with Boston, with uh, Charo when he was captain there, he was like, we don't have any rookies. Yeah, they're still going to like pack the bus or, or do whatever they got to do. Is like, But the, there's there's no rookies. You play in the NHL, you're all here. And I think in junior, same thing. Like, remember in college, a lot of the college teams now, there's no freshmen. You're all in this team. Yes, there's still a pecking order. Don't get me wrong. But you're not treating, the seniors aren't treating the freshmen like crap. You know, the fourth year guys in the O and the, and the WHL aren't treating the first year guys like crap. But I think that comes from the coaches. And the coaches and the management got to step in and say, guys, we understand. We all play the game. We get they're going to pick up pucks. They're going to help load the bus. Like, those are things fine. But why can't a, why can't a captain grab a bag? The best thing I ever saw was, was a captain helping, you know, put pucks in the bucket after a skate. You know, you talk about Vancouver. We had Bo Horvat out here in the summer skating with us. He skated with us for years. But he's one of the guys throwing puck, pucks in the bucket. You know, with a couple of junior guys. Junior guys see that. What do they do? Like, pff, I play in the old. This guy's making, you know, sheets in the NHL. He's picking up pucks. Well, I, th- I think I could pick up pucks, you know? So I think it's like all that leadership qualities, but it's got to come from the top, like management coaches. You squash that right away. There's no, 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 there's, that doesn't happen on our team. You know what I mean? Um, but the, the question I was going to ask you is going back to kind of what we're talking about when you went your first year kind of, you know, to Swift and, and get a chance to play in the dub, do you feel that you were prepared? I mean, like my thing right now with a lot of parents is like, I, I, I have a son. So if my son wants to play junior, I'm going to send him away. That's fine. But he's got to be mature enough. Like if he can't boil an egg, doesn't want to do his laundry, doesn't know where to go shopping for Tylenol or, or, or salt, then I can't send him away. Like I can't, but we have kids right now that they can't do anything. They're, they're so dependent on their parents. And it's like, all right, here you go. Seven hours up to Sudbury, go have fun, buddy. You're going to play in the O. You're going to make the NHL. Like you, you sent your kid handicapped away somewhere to live with another family with a bunch of other kids that are going to bug them, pick you know what I mean? Like you're, you're handicapping your kid in certain situations. So I guess for you, I, the question for you is, like, did you feel looking back now that you were kind of prepared to live on, like, live with another family and, and be, you know, kind of in that, in that junior, I don't want to call it a grind because it is fun if you have a good experience, but it can be a grind, right? Yeah. I mean, it was a grind. My first, uh, my first, you know, early years in the dub for me, I didn't like going to the rink because of the older guys and stuff. And just quickly to touch on what we were talking about coming from coaches and management. I think a lot of the times in, in those past years, what the problem is, is a lot of those coaches were, went through it too. So yeah. they were just to it and they were like, Hey, well, this is the way it is. And nobody was stepping up to do anything. And I think, I think they've done a, from what my understanding of it's changed a little bit and coaches way, are doing way better. It. You're right. Way better. Better. Um, yeah. 
for me, uh, like I told you, my mom left at a young age. My dad was a fireman. Uh, so by the time I was 10, my sister was 12. We were staying at home at nights by ourselves. So I learned how to cook at a really young age. I was doing my laundry at a young, really young age. Um, but that doesn't mean that I was necessarily ready to move away from home. Uh, another problem was, is I had a girlfriend back home that caused a lot of um, issues. And another reason why one of the times I quit and, and went home and, uh, I mean, girls, if you want, listen, anybody playing hockey, you want to make it and you're in junior, leave the girls alone, man. They're going to be there. They're going to be there forever. <laughs> so I true. promise. So uh, true, yeah. You can't stop your kids from having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, whatever that looks like. If we're talking girls, boys, or doesn't matter. Uh, you can't stop it really, but somehow finding a way to, you know, make them realize that, you know, they're not as old as they think they are. I know I always felt like I was way older than I was. And now I'm looking, I'm 33. I'm like, I see like a 16 year old. I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. Is that what I look like at 16? And I look at a picture and I look even younger than that. And acting even like, so, I mean, I don't think I talk about it all the time too. It's like, it goes back to the mental side of the game that I wanted to bring up is like, you know, teaching kids how to be a pro. And unfortunately, you want to move away from 16 years old and play major junior hockey, you're going to be ex expected more of than a normal 16 year old, you know, you have to, uh, whatever, wear a suit and tie, be on time, be here, do that, whatever, um, show up even when you don't want to show up. Uh, it's, it's hard. But if there's some way somehow that we can start to prepare the kids, uh, not only to move away, but to, to be professionals and, and to show them what it takes. Uh, I know a lot of guys I've talked to, they went into their draft interviews and they said the wrong thing. Like, and all of a sudden they get blackballed or whatever. I know Terry Ryan shared the story. It's like, okay, is he got asked the question, I think by in Montreal, I don't know if it was a draft interview, but when he got there and the coach was like, so you got curfew and uh, you're with a girl and you got 10 minutes uh, to get, to get home for curfew. So what do you do? And, and he tells the story of, well, I, I get it on with her for five minutes and then I, I get home just before curfew, like trying yeah. to be funny or whatever to the coach, but like, you got to pick your spots. Like, <laughs> and it didn't go over very well. And then after that, he was, they were questioning whether he does drugs and this and that, and he got sent down. I mean, there's just a number of things. So learning how to prepare for interviews, how to present yourself. I know we're trying to be ourselves and, and just, you know, have fun and do everything else, but making these kids understand that if you're willing and wanting to make that jump to major junior, especially in pro, like you're going to have to sacrifice things and you're going to have to grow up quicker. Um, but a lot of that will rely, uh, fall on the parents and, and making sure that you are preparing them. I and you know, hear you talk about kids. Uh, I know them all too well. I know kids that, you know, they still don't do their own laundry and, and everything else and uh, can't cook, can't do anything, have zero responsibility. Um, they literally do nothing. Their moms clean their room, everything else. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier in the show is like, you gotta, you gotta make them work for it and show them that there's life outside of hockey so that they not only are well more equipped for life after hockey, but so that they appreciate the fact that they're playing hockey and that hockey can, can, if you get to a certain level can provide you a, a life and you get to do something that you actually love to do. Um, something that's not always fun because it is a grind sometimes, but I'll tell you what, it, it's, it's got to be one of the best jobs in the world. If you're a hockey player growing up, you tell me what else is a better job than being a pro hockey player if that's what you love to do. So I don't know. There's There's got to be more done. And uh, I think it, you know, there's more parents can do. Uh, I really believe that coaches on a whole um, stemming right from Hockey Canada, the, the program could be completely revamped in different areas to start shifting, you know, towards these sort of things and, um, I know that like the under 17 and under 16 programs, it's sort of your first real taste at, you know, what it takes to be a pro or the under 15s, whatever it is out here in Ontario. But you go to these things and I, I always share this story is that I remember going to uh, under 17s and Carey Price, same age as Carey Price. And he was there, Team BC. And, you know, he's there and he's there for business, man. That guy was there. We're 15. He's there for business. We're all chewing tobacco and being idiots and laughing, joking, making fun of Carey Price because he's all dressed up, looking professional and acting, not getting involved in all the crap and everything else. Well, <laughs> yeah, Price has had his struggles, but 
look at Carey Price now, and there's not a single guy from that camp that is still playing in the NHL that I believe, I think they're all done now. Um, there may be one other one, but there's, you know, Carey Price, he was a professional right from 15 years old and he, there we were making fun of him for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, yeah. I well, know. similar I to that, I- man, we had uh, like John, John Tavares played in London for a, a year here for the Knights and, same thing. I, I do some skill stuff with the Knights and I remember a couple of the guys, you know, the cool guys in the O back then and back in the day and saying, oh, you know, yeah, after the game, like John Devere spends like half hour stretching and doing a little workout after the game. Like kind of, you know, like we all went through what a loser guy does push ups after practice. What a loser guy eats chicken breast for lunch. What a loser, you know? And I don't know, John Tavares is probably done okay. He's probably got a nice healthy bank account and he's probably not going to have to work ever again in his life. You know what I mean? And those other guys, you know, went on to play CIS hockey potentially and are probably done, you know, are done playing now, right? So it's, I totally agree with you, man. It's just being, and those are guys, if you look at, you know, a guy like Carey Price or a guy like John Tavares, for the most part, and I can't speak for them, but they were pretty authentic to who they were. They loved the game. They knew that going out for beers right after the game probably wasn't right. They knew that going to stay up late watching pornos in the hotel with the rest of the U15s or U16s or whatever probably wasn't the right thing to do. Get a good sleep, become the rink with the suit on the next day. Like that was the right thing to do. And they were just them. They didn't care. Say whatever you want. I don't care. I'm going to go try to play pro. You know, so they kind of had a little bit of a different mindset. And I'm, I'm going to assume a lot of that came from the coaches that they had around them at young ages, the parents, you know, how the parents raised them. You know, it's not just by accident you find a guy like Carey Price or a guy like John Tavares or a guy like Sidney Crosby. Like, there's some things that happen along the way that helped him, you know, or her, uh, you know, become, you know, who they are, right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, we always look to what we want to watch. Uh, you know, we see a great player and we want to see how they're training or what they're doing. And, you know, maybe we need to dig into what their parents did a little more. <laughs> it's totally, yeah. Yeah. You know I mean, like, uh, figure out, you know, what, what was it? Uh, I think in some cases, some guys, they're, they're just, you know, their personalities may be more fit to that. But I, I agree with you that it comes down to coaches and, and parents that can have a, just a huge, huge impact, uh, on the way that they are and, and learning the value of hard work and dedication and commitment and staying true to your goals, whatever that may be. Um, even when it's not the cool thing to do. And I think that's a really hard thing for kids is trying to be accepted, trying to be loved, trying to fit in, trying to be popular. I hate that word, but, um, and it's funny. I mean, yeah, you talk about, you're right. Like all the guys that the cool guys in the NHL or the the OHL, WHL, most of them aren't playing anymore. Um, and I'll tell you what, Carey Price is a pretty cool guy. (laughs) Yeah. I'd like to hang out with him now. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, You know, so it's, I mean, Carey Price is still a goalie, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, hey, last last one here. I know I've I've, I've taken up some of your time, but la- last kind of one more for parents out there and stuff. At you know, looking back on it now as an adult and again as a dad, at what age did did things start to kind of f- just begin to fall off the rails? And was there, if you look back now, was there potentially an opportunity to to pull you back onto the rails? You know what I mean? Or was it something that you know, that, that maybe could have been prevented or, you know, whether that's as, as extreme as saying, buddy, you're not going back to the dub. You're done hockey, man. You're coming home. I need, you need to be home, you know, or, Hey, we're getting you to another team because this is not working there. I'm talking to your agent. We're moving you. Like, is there anything like that that could have kind of maybe happened to kind of steer you the back the right way? Or was it something that was just destined? That's a funny, that's a funny question. Um, because I remember I packed up my truck uh, in Swift Kern. I got rookie of the year, Swift Kern Broncos when I was 17. Right here. There it is. There it is. Hardware. I like it. Yeah, same trophy as Joe Sackick. No big deal. That's, <laughs> that's I've ever won. I never won anything else. Um, but anyways, going into the following year, I, you know, I was, I had every opportunity to play on the first line, everything. And I just wasn't in a good mindset. I ended up leaving the team seven games in. I packed my truck up. I remember I told Dean Chanel, who's now assistant coach for Carolina. I was like, Dean, like, I don't care if I ever play hockey again. I'm going home. I'm just, I'm done. And I had already gone home the year before on what would now be a mental health leave um, for a week and came back and man, did I get roasted in that for the Justin call me baby, go home, baby. What are you coming back? Oh, it was bad. But anyways, so I'm there and I remember I told him, I was like, trade me uh, to Vancouver or Everett. Those are the only teams that I'm going to play for. If you don't, if I can't get to them, I'd, I'll just never play hockey and I don't really care because I thought those in my mind that was closer to home. And so 
I, I went home. I played for the, what now the burn or Coquitlam express was a burn express at the time played with Kyle Torres on our line. I had nine points in my first three games and uh, whatever stuff. Then I really started to get into the, the drugs that year. Um, but I ended up getting traded to Everett. Uh, they traded me to the Everett Silver Tips about a month after I was home and I'd already signed with Burnaby. Burnaby had given me some money under the table that yeah. wasn't supposed to be. I actually found the, the uh, contract that was supposed to never be shown. I found it in my <laughs> box of stuff my dad sent me last month. It's kind of funny. Uh, but uh, I remember my friend, he, uh, he got on the phone like Kevin Constantine. He was Jack Adams award winner in the NHL, Pittsburgh coach. He was coach Everett at the time calls me he's like yeah brady like you know we're really excited to have you you're gonna come down here you're gonna play in the first line with peter Mueller and zach hamill and uh or on the next line with andre fiala you'll be teach you how to penalty kill better you know we're really excited to have you we've wanted you for a long time and okay that's great and i just remember thinking i hung up the phone my friend was there i looked at my friend i'm like i'm not going like i'm not going and so kevin constant called me back like 30 minutes with my immigration paperwork and i got my friend I'm like, it's Kevin Constantine, like, pretend you're me. And I gave him the phone and he's like, uh, I'm not coming and hung up the phone, like pretty much. And so my dad was away. He was away doing something for a conference for firefighting the union. And so if he was there, I probably would have, he would have drove me to Everett. Maybe things would have been different. Um, but then, you know, shortly after that, I quit the Burnaby Express that year and they went on to win the RBC uh, that year um, and then begged Dean Chanel to take me back as a 19 year old to Swift Current. That's how I ended up back in Swift Current because I got traded in the trade. Yeah, right. the report. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know what? Going back to the question is like, could they have done anything different? Uh, I mean, they Swift Current tried to bring in a sports psychologist to talk to me, a really world-renowned Max Offenberger, who I actually reconnected when I was with the Lightning organization in the American League. And really great guy. Uh, but I think for me personally, it came down to just not wanting to tell anybody what was really going on, dating back to when I was a kid, the stuff that was going on, trying to hide that. And um it's, it's just one of these things. I think for me, the, the biggest thing that hindered me in, in, in junior was the culture in the dressing room from an early, from the early standpoint of just being you know made fun of because I was going through different things. Like I had to go home because I was just like legit going to commit suicide. And yeah. Like they didn't, I didn't tell anybody what was really going on. They didn't, nobody really cared. They just assumed that I was not a good teammate and not a good, you know, this or that. And they talk about, you know, you have a broken arm cast. Sure. You can show I'm going home because I got a broken right. arm, but you got to head or a broken heart i mean you can't show that you just sound like a pussy more or less um you don't have what it takes to be a good teammate or whatever so i think you know yeah if i would have ended up you know playing for the vancouver giants would it have helped who knows um being close to home being close to my family and and girlfriend at the time maybe it would have helped maybe it would have been even worse but to really answer your question if we can stay away from any outside of distractions other than hockey, you talk about John Tavares and Terry Price focusing on hockey and, and being that professional and having that goal. And they probably didn't have a, a ton of time for girls back in that time because they were too focused on what their goals were. Um, giving your kids opportunity to be themselves, experience life, not just focus on hockey, but at the same time, somehow make them realize that when you really want something, especially a hockey career, man, does it take sacrifice and sometimes sacrificing time with friends and family and girlfriends or whatever that is needs to take precedent. And I'm not sure what the answer for that is at a young age of trying to make them realize that. Cause I think hindsight is 2020 20, always we could tell our kids things, but we don't listen to our parents for the majority. At least I didn't. Yeah. Um, but Checking in, it goes back, I think, checking in with your kids. And, and if your kids have gone away uh, playing major junior, don't, ex, don't just um, assume that they're doing great or that they're having a good time or that things in the dressing room are good and that the coaches are making sure that they're taken care of on and off the ice and everything else. Like really start to ask the hard questions and, and try to get to know them. Uh, on a very personal level and get to know the dynamic of the team. Doesn't mean you have to call the coach or anything like that. My mom did that one night when I was, she was, a, I don't want to get into that. It was not a good, it was not <laughs> good. Well, let's just say that. Um, but anyways, it, uh, it, and the coaches pulled me into the dressing room. They're like, what's this all about? And press played on the message. Oh, it was horror. It was horrendous. I was that like, oh, sucks. Yeah, yeah, but it is whatever. 
I love my mom. Me and my mom are great. She's most my rock when I was in jail. So uh, I absolutely adore my mom now. She would have made some mistakes when I was younger, but I forgive her for but, that. You know, when things like that, though, and I'm, you know, I, you're a parent, I'm a parent, like, she's doing that out of pure love, man. She just cared about you. Want, what's going on? Like wants to find out, you know, whatever that, whatever she's asking about, but like she's only doing it because she loves. And the problem is, you know, 10, 15 years ago, all that stuff, your mom called the coach or email the coach, like, holy, you're going to get it from even the coaches. Some of these hard school or old school coaches, right? You leave for a mental issue. Aside from a death in the family or some kind of actual injury, I say actual injury, like physical injury, you're yeah. like you said, you're a pussy. Like, why are you going home? This is brutal. You stick, stick it out, you know? And I think it's such a different culture now. And it sounds to me like I had parents that if I had to come home from junior and said, I quit, I don't want to be there anymore. My dad would have given me a bit of static, but they would have respected my decision and probably let me do it. You know what I mean? So for you, you know, it sounds like your dad was, you know, you guys probably had a good relationship and if you really didn't want to go, he was not going to drive you and force you to go somewhere where you didn't really want to go, which I, I respect that. I think that's not a bad thing. Um, did, did the drugs and stuff come in more because of buddies and just experimenting with buddies and stuff? Was that kind of where it kind of like kind of the group that you were hanging out with back home and stuff kind of were starting to get into it a little bit and, and stuff like that? Yeah. So like, you know, I had friends, some of my best friends growing up, you know, they stopped playing hockey when we we're 13, 14, they started to go down that path. And I was, you know, I'm sorry, I can't have anything to do with you. I'm a hockey player. I don't do that. And uh, so I was like, you know, you, if you talk to people that I went to high school with, they ask you who the last person would have been to be a drug addict. It was me. I was like, Mr. Anti-drug. Sure. Like, sure I even drank and everything else, but I was like, no, like I just, it was a no, it was a no for me. And so uh, it first happened when I was, I was at Merritt Mount Music Festival, which is a big country music festival. And I'll never forget it. And it was just so crazy the way it happened. And I saw these guys that I'd grew up, grown up with and played hockey with. Uh, the majority of them were a year older. I just graduated high school right after my 17 year old year with Swift Current. And I just remember they were, they were all high on ecstasy and they were, it looked like they were having so much fun. Yeah. And so like we got there a couple days early and we got there on like a Wednesday, two days before the festival started or Tuesday and started Thursday. I don't remember the day, but partying and having a good time drinking and all that stuff. And I just remember watching them for a couple of days. And I think on the Friday I, I asked the one, I'm like, maybe I'll do it with you. Like, it looks like it's a lot of fun. Like, you know, and he's like, and he's like, well here. And I remember I had this girl, girl, my girlfriend with me and she was so against drugs and stuff. I was like, no, nah, like I got to spend this night with her, but tomorrow, tomorrow we'll do it. And so he's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll get it. And I'll never forget, man. It was like, I, I wonder if, if I would have ever done it, if it wasn't for, for this. And it was just crazy. So my, my girlfriend at the time, she got really sick. I don't know if food poisoning something. And so Saturday morning rolled around, she was really sick. And, uh, you know, she's like, I remember I left early out of my truck. We we're sitting in the back of my truck and went down to the river where everyone's drinking. I got just hammered. It's like 10 in the morning, come back hammered. She's like, ready? Like, we got to go. Like, I want to go home. Like, I'm sick. And I'm like, okay, sure. But you got to drive. Cause I'm like, I can't drive. Yeah. Like, sorry, I know you're sick, but if you want to go, you got to drive. Cause I'm, I didn't know we were leaving. And so I'll never forget packed up. We're driving out and I'm not kidding. We were already driving, rolling around, we're rolling away. And all of a sudden it's like, bang, 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 bang on the window. And there's the guy. He's like, where are you going? And he like, remember he like opened his hand and he had the pills in his hand. And I'm just like, I'm like, stop the car for a sec. So I went out there. And I'm like, man, I'm leaving. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He's like, man, I got them here. Just, you know, just take it for the road or whatever. And I was drunk. I'll never forget it. And uh, so I did. And, and, you know, I remember driving home by myself, I was by myself and she's driving sick and sober and I'm just, you know, out of it. And, uh, I actually walked in my dad. So I walked into my house. My dad was watching home videos um, of me when I was a kid. I'll never forget it. And I'm just like, Whoa, like, you know, and, um, from that moment on, I think, you know, two days later I, I did it again. And, uh, the day after that, I did it again. And again, I did it every day for like three months straight because it was the first time where I was like, wow, like this feels way better than being in my own right. head all the time and, and having to live with all this. It was just like, I didn't think about any of that stuff anymore. I didn't think about what happened to me as a kid. I didn't think about the pressures of hockey. I was just like, wherever I was doing, whatever, it felt like this was the place to be. I was having the best time. And I just, I got it so addicted to it. And it's kind of where it all started. And so that broke down the first barrier mm -hmm. 
from there I went to, to Coke, which was a no go for me. I was like, no way that's disgusting. And, uh, I think it probably would have ended there. There's no way I ever get into heroin if it's not for Oxycontin. Um, the jump to all of a sudden doing heroin and, and being even around people that are doing heroin is like pretty far fetched. Um, but when you get into the Oxycontin, um, and then all of a sudden you lose your prescription from the doctor and you got to start to go to the street. Well, there's a guy that I used to go get my pills from all the time. And every time I go see him, he was smoking heroin and uh, he was sold pills. He's smoking heroin. And he'd always ask me, I'm like, man, like, are you nuts? Like I would never do that. Like never in a million years, like get away from me. Like give me my pills at the time. I thought they were two different things and they're not, they're basically the same thing. It's the same drug basically, but one's a prescription and one's not. Yeah. And the one day I went to go meet him and he's like, man, I just sold my last few pills. And I think I'd already been like 12 hours without any. And I was sick. It was like one of the first times that I really started to go through withdrawal. And I was like, man, it was bad. I always tell people I would have eaten dog crap if it would have made me feel better on this day. And I just remember he's like, well, it's going to be like probably like maybe like tomorrow morning when I get more like sorry. And it was like, I don't know, like 11 o'clock in the morning, you know what I mean? So like another 24 yeah. hours, I'm like what he's sitting there smoking air when he's like, well, here, you want to feel better? Just try some of this, give it to me, man. And uh, from that moment on, I think I did oxys the next day, uh, went and saw him again the next day and, and bought some oxys, but smoked heroin with him again the next day. And then the next day I went back and he's like, you need pills. I'm like, no, let's just give me some of that. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I just stopped doing oxys and that's how it happened. It was just an instant switch. It was within, within 24 to 36 hours, I went from doing oxys to switching to heroin 100%. Uh, and then, you know, probably a year after that, I started to use needles and, you know, about 2013, the heroin turned to fentanyl in Vancouver. There's no heroin anywhere anymore. It's all fentanyl. They call it heroin, but there's that's no crazy, heroin. man. The reason being, a lot of people are like, "Well, why fentanyl? Like, what? Like, why? What's with the fentanyl? And and why is it all switched to fentanyl? Well, it's it's a pretty easy answer. It's that one. It's synthetic. You can pretty much get all the stuff to make off the black web and web and make it yourself. And where is before heroin would come from places like Afghanistan and this and that. And like, you'd have to have like you know, large amounts where like you can get like a kilo of heroin or a kilo of fentanyl. And if it's like fentanyl, that kilo of fentanyl can make like, I don't know, 50 or a hundred kilos of gotcha. that same heroin. Yeah, okay. So it's, and it's just like, and now these, all these people have their hands on it and they're cutting it with, they don't know what they're doing. And so you never know what you're getting. It's strong. It's not strong. It's strong. It's not strong. And the craziest thing that people don't realize is like, when you're in addiction, like when I was on the streets in Vancouver and I was no exception, I was like just the same as like, you see people dropping, dying, overdosing. And it's like, where did he get that stuff? I want that stuff. Oh, like really? I want, you know what I mean? Like yeah, I want yeah. that stuff. Like I don't want, you know, I want the strongest stuff possible. And it's just, it's such a sickness. And you don't even think, you don't even, you're not even thinking like, Oh, well, I mean, if that, I can handle it. And if it kills me, someone will Narcan me. Or if I die, I die. It didn't matter. You, you don't even think about that kind of stuff. You just think, oh, strong stuff. I want it. I want it. I want it. And everybody was like that. It was just like they, you see somebody dropping and everybody's trying to find that guy who has that stuff because they want that experience too. Like It just goes to show you how powerful this stuff is. Like not just on a powerful, it's going to kill you level. I'm talking like powerful it's got you it's a thief it takes everything from you it consumes your entire life and um whatever you have it will take from you and i'm just grateful that i'm on the other side of it now man well man dude so are we like this is it's been awesome and i know i took up a lot of your time and i i definitely wow. could do a part two part three part four <laughs> Anytime, man. You let me know. And uh, people don't know this, but I was uh, fashionably late for this. I, I totally uh, gapped out because I, I'm working on, I'm really working on getting my buddy into treatment and, and making phone calls. I've been on the phone a lot the last 48 hours and uh, we're not out of the woods yet. He's still living in the shelter and in typical addict fashion. He's, you know, they want to make excuses for why they can't come now and this and that, but I'm hoping his parents are going, his parents are going to, uh, to meet him um, anytime now and hopefully they can 
you know, convince him. He, he does tell me he's been texting me uh, even during this, you know, he's like, don't worry. You know, I want this. I just need to couple things to align. And I know I did. I made the same excuses, but it's my hope that we're going to get him out here and, and get him the help that he needs. Um, but at the end of the day, we can't force anybody to do anything. You can only open that door and, and kind of give him a little push. You can't, you can't force him to do it. I'm just hoping that we can help save his life because I'll tell you what, I was in the same position he's in. Um, and it's, it's no way to live. You're not living, you're just surviving. And it's just, it's no way to live. And when you see a former teammate and friend in that situation, being on the other side of it, it's pretty eye opening, uh, to realize, you know, I was living in shelters. I was living on the street. I, I, I looked ill like he did. And when you're really in it, you know, it's a problem, but you don't really care that it's a problem. You just, you're just trying to get through the day and, okay, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and then, okay, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like years have gone by and it's just, I feel for him. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, I'm out of it and that, you know, I've been able to connect with him and, and hopefully can help steer him in the right direction. But even if we get him treatment again, that's just one more step. It's going to be in a battle for him for the rest of his life, just like it is mine. So, you know what, though, man, it's super – and don't, I could sit here and talk. I got really, I got nothing going on the rest of the day. So don't, don't worry about that. Anytime you want me to come I on, um, we'll, we'll do it. And if you want, you know, if you want, uh, if you want me to, if there's anybody that's been on my show that you'd like to have on your show, by all means, let me know. And I'll try to make the introduction. I can't make promises, but the majority of these guys, um, that I've had on my show are great. And I'm not one of the guys that it's like, Oh, like I've been on podcasts before. And they're like, we have a rival podcaster on today. And I'm like, <laughs> rival podcaster i'm like i'm not competing with anybody i'm just we all have different uh people that listen to our shows and you know going back to you know if you have five people listening that you know haven't heard my story or even one or whatever well guess what maybe it's gonna make the difference for them to to reach out and get the help that they need and so it's it's not a competition for me not with the puck not with puck sport not with my podcast not with anything and so I, i'd be more than willing i know you know a ton of people too but if there's anybody that you know if you, you feel like maybe you want them on your show and, and you think I can help uh, by all means, please, please let me know and, and keep up the good work, man. Cause uh, you know, I know it's not easy, um, but people out there appreciate what you're doing. And I know it's probably been some way somehow therapeutic for you as well, because I enjoy doing them. Um, oh, totally. And it's, it's yeah, no, it's, and I, I always say this, like I learn, I selfishly learn stuff from the podcast is I think why I secretly do them just cause I always learn something from somebody, but I really appreciate sharing your story. And obviously I think this is very helpful for me as a parent, number one. Uh, and I think for a lot of parents out there that are going to go through some tough times, whether it's whatever, marijuana, drugs, sex, whatever that is, right. I think it's, uh, it's not an easy, it's not easy being a parent, number one. And it's really not easy being a, an adolescent and a teenager and going through high school and whatever, if it's hockey, soccer, whatever that is, it's not a, it's not always just roses and goal scoring and trophies. Right. So I think we got to be prepared for that. And hearing a story like yours is it kind of really puts reality to the whole, to the whole, you know, life really, you know what I mean? This, this can happen. And like you said, at 10, 11, 12 years old, no one, like, there's no way, there, there's no way Brady's going to be on the streets of Vancouver. There's no way. Right. And yeah. next thing you know, uh, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years and, and it started. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, where can people, where can people find you, buddy? So if people are reaching out, puck support, by the way, I've been on it. It's awesome. The gear is wicked. I'm going to order some. I love the fact that each piece of clothing and hats have a little, a name and a date. It's, it's awesome, man. It's, it's just, it, the whole thing is just, uh, is really, really cool what you've done and you put a lot of thought behind it and the, the gear looks awesome. So congrats on that, but where can people find you and, and kind of what you're doing and, and all the initiatives you got going on? Wow. You got, you got 10 minutes to tell to, for <laughs> uh, social media. Let's not just give you the main um, puck support.com and the website is going to get revamped. You have to remember that everything puck support has basically been me right from the clothing out all the social media. And it's been me doing the best that I can, but finally we're going to have people come in and, and take over the professionals, let them do what they're good at. I'll stay do with the things that I'm okay at. And, uh, Hopefully we can take it to the next level. So pucksport.com, uh, anywhere on social media at puck support. Uh, you could check out at puck support warriors to see the ambassadors and people involved. That's continually growing. And, and we're going to put more time into that, uh, especially once COVID is over, if it's ever over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, if they want to reach out to me directly, you can do so Brady at pucksupport.com. If you need support, 
Sandra at Puck Support. She's our executive director of mental health and addiction. Um, I'm on Instagram at mental health hockey. Uh, that's my new page because hockey to heroin got booted by the bullies. Um, so at mental health hockey and also at hockey to hell podcast on Instagram, uh, check it out on YouTube, hockey to hell and back with the number two, not spelt the proper way. Cause why would I do that? That just doesn't make sense. That's not a hockey podcast. You gotta have the number in there, bud. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's uh yeah it's been a lot of fun um there's something else i was gonna say oh going back to the kids you know like if your kids are going through stuff but they're making mistakes sometimes they need consequences uh it's not easy um but give them consequences hold them accountable doesn't mean you have to beat them or anything like that it's not what i'm saying but you know whatever that looks like if they're misusing their phone and bullying people on their phone well guess what they're they're not mature enough to have a phone or a social media account or whatever that looks like um, everybody has to do their own kind of policing within their family, but just don't assume that your kid's not one of the ones that may be struggling or picking on people or whatever. Um, don't be that naive, uh, or being the, one of the ones that's being picked on and then just pretending like everything's okay. So just, you know, I think we can all do a better job just actually having the, the real conversations. And I know, um, a lot of, I've noticed a lot of people, they don't sit down and have dinner anymore and just sit around the kitchen table without phones, without TVs, without outside distractions. And, uh, you know, I grew up without a TV in my kitchen and there was no cell phones really, obviously. So I think it's a very good opportunity for a family to sit down and, and have that conversation. And obviously it can't always happen because there's hockey and different things pulling out, but at least try to make a point of, of getting together um, with your immediate family and, and having those conversations, just checking how was your day or whatever. And, you know, when they say good, like, like you mentioned earlier, ask the, uh, ask the questions that go a little bit more in depth and, um, challenge your kids every day. Like, okay, well, what did you do nice for somebody today? Uh, you know, did anybody get picked on? How did that feel for you? What did it feel like for them? What did you do? What could you do? Um, did you feel that you could say anything or, you know, did you tell anybody or, or whatever that is? And I just think it's a, it's, it's a good place to start. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to me, uh, you know, I do my best to, and I always do get back to everybody. Um, but yeah, follow me on social media, email me, whatever. And, uh, if you have extra time, check out the podcast. Um, got Michael Landsberg coming on Sunday, Paul Rosen on Wednesday. I don't know when this comes out, but, um, we try to keep it interesting. Kelly Rudy is going to be on in the near future, Jordy Ben, and also, uh, Bo Horvat has puck support stuff too. You mentioned Bo Horvat. Yeah. So him and, uh, him and Holly Horvat have some puck support here. The puck, the Canucks have been very, very supportive um, of what we're doing. So awesome. it's, uh, it's exciting. It's exciting. So yeah, we're not going anywhere um, and it's only going to grow and, and continue to get better. And if anybody wants to get involved, including yourself, I mean, like we're, we're starting to really build, um, build a structure and foundation in which we should have done, but I realized that we couldn't wait. We needed to do this now because of how many people are struggling and uh we just wanted to make ourselves available um, to let people know that they're not alone. And if people see the slogan that says, it's okay to be not okay, I know the real English is it's okay not to be okay, but there's a movie called that. And I didn't want to get hammered with the trademark right <laughs> away. So I go. just, I put it that way and I look at it like to be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyways, oh, awesome, buddy. I appreciate it, man. Big time. And like Great. I said, anytime, if you want to chat or if you want me to come back on, you need help with guests, whatever it is, let me know. Um, I'm really happy that we were able to do this and I'm sorry for being late. No, no worries, buddy. It was great, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, we will definitely be in touch. I think this is a uh, start of a bit of a relationship. So for anybody out there and listening to this, uh, found a new buddy here. So this is great, but yeah, thanks a lot, Brady. Appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. All right. First three steps, huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today.